Well, welcome back to the Indie Vets Happy Hour. This is our 30th episode. Woo! I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Heller, DVM, and I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Marissa Brunetti, VMD. VMD. We like to make that little <laughs> distinction there. And we've got a guest today. We're here with Dr. Joanne Connolly, and you are a DVM, right? I am DVM and DMV too in French. So. Uh, awesome. Ah, awesome. Perfect. Well, I will introduce a little bit of your background before we begin. But today we are going to be talking about physical diseases that are induced by stress. And I'm very interested in hearing a little bit more from you. So Dr. Connolly, you are a graduate of the University of Montreal. You did an internship in small animal medicine, surgery, and ER at the Michigan Vet Specialists. And you are the owner of Haley's Angels Vet Services. You're in Florida, right? Yep. I've been in Florida six years. I started uh, Haley's Angels in-home uh, end of life and euthanasia service in Arizona. That was in 2007. Yep. Awesome. And so what does Haley's Angels do currently? I still go to people's home uh, to help assist pets go to heaven and be there to comfort the family of two and four legged friends. The animals that are left behind uh, can go through a lot of grieving and so it's good to uh, get them as much closure as possible. Yeah. Well, I know your background isn't just in end of life and, you know, grief counseling. I know you've done some general practice work. You've done emergency medicine, shelter and rescue work, even exotics. Yeah. And you were in Connecticut to start, right? And then you went out to Arizona and you're now in Florida. Yeah. The hanging out in the sun. <laughs> mm-hmm. That sounds very nice right about now. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> it's cold up here. And the winter causes a lot of stress. Yes, so it's a perfect topic for today. You've also been involved in numerous charitable and nonprofit endeavors as well, I saw. Yes, I, I'm currently volunteering at an exotic wildlife uh, refuge. Um, I can hear the lions from my backyard, so they live like they're just 10 minutes around the block from me. Wow. It was a quite, a, quite a gift when I moved to Florida and realized that I could uh, help out lions and tigers and all kinds of other exotic creatures that they have over there. Yeah, that's that's so cool. It's definitely a difference between the South and yeah. up here, the, us Yankees in the North. We don't have a lot of large cats running around like like they do. In- You'd be surprised. Yeah. But, but yes, definitely Florida and Texas, I think, have probably the number one and two, right? <laughs> yeah. You've also had numerous publications and speaker engagements as well, I saw. And of course, most importantly, you're author of a couple of books. The Animal Teachings 1 and Animal Teachings 2. Tell us a little bit about those books. So I wanted to share the teachings of animals on my path because after you get out of school and you think you know everything and then you realize quickly you don't know anything and you learn a lot as you go. And we're still writing textbooks, you know, we're still figuring things out. So um, I really felt like it. I needed to write it on paper for myself too so I don't forget those amazing pearls of wisdom that the animals taught me going to their homes. Uh, The in-home euthanasia service was my dog's legacy. My old dog, Haley, turned 14. She was a rescue. I was able to help her pass at home peacefully because I worked at the hospital. I could bring the medications home. She had trouble breathing, so I really did not want to stress her in the car to the hospital. And it just snowballed before my eyes. It was not my idea to start the service, but after she passed, people started calling me out of nowhere, friend of a friend. And so I ended up spending a lot of hours, you know, in the closet, in the bedroom, (laughs) under the bed, wherever the animal wanted to be and trying to minimize the stress and then learning so much and talking to families about how they feel their take on why their pets got sick, the timing of death, you know, and it's always been my passion, really, why do we get sick and really finding reasons and then applying this to my patients too, because It was pretty clear and quickly when I got out of school, some things just really hit me that I would see an amazing synchronicity between diagnosing, let's say, a a pet with back issue. And then the owner would say, oh, yeah, I have chronic back pain, too. And then you diagnose someone else with IBD. And then the owner says, oh, yeah, I've got chronic, you know, GI issues, too. And it's just mesmerizing. But I've wanted to really push it to, hey, what's going on here? It's not just random. Interesting. Well, yeah. we, we always start the, the podcast talking about who this podcast episode is intended for. And I'm certainly going to find this extremely interesting. So definitely veterinarians out there that don't think about this kind of stuff on a day-to-day basis. Hopefully it's for you. As always, technicians listening to this, I think can get a lot out of it. 
And we always invite our general population of pet owners out there to listen in as well. And hopefully they can, can learn something from you. I agree completely. It's for everybody. It's for everybody, yep. for sure. So tell us a bit about your background in stress management. How did you come to be an expert on this topic, among others? So the reason I'm here alive talking to you today is because I manage my own stress. <laughs> <laughs> I was really sick earlier on. And actually, it started in vet school. Surprise. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> the biggest stress of my life, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't really realize it until it hits you ultimately. And then you see how out of balance you might be. That's the biggest lesson to me. It's like, OK, what did I do wrong? So a few things, a few things that happened to me, first of all. So when I was in my senior year, I was very um, intense and out of balance and judgmental and I wanted to know everything and be perfect so that is a form of stress when you're pushing yourself to the limit always mm -hmm. and I do want to define stress as anything that's bad for your body anxiety again putting extra pressure on yourself wanting to be a perfectionist which a lot of veterinarians are yes it can be emotional shock that animals will experience and people too and then you've got acute stress or chronic stress. So little negative emotion eating at you, whether it's, uh, again, anxiety, uh, anger, feeling unfulfilled and you're not sure what it is, um, boredom in animals, you know, indoor mm. cats, fat cats will eat their emotions until they pop, you know. So stress mm. is just very different. It's lots of different ways to experience it. So when I was in my senior year of vet school and I was following this large animal vet to the farm, we went to see this calf with diarrhea. And I was really upset at my teacher, which today, again, I was wrong. But at the time, I wanted to know exactly the cause of the diarrhea of the calf. I wanted my teacher to run all the tests in the book. Uh, what my teacher did, which was great, he gave this calf a dewormer because often we can't treat for all parasites we might miss a parasite so he treated he covered all his bases he gave iv fluids to the calf to keep him from dehydrating mm -hmm. um it's a, if it's a viral diarrhea it will take its course he gave it antibiotic which was great in case it's bacterial or secondary from the viral diarrhea you know that turn into bacterial so he covered all his bases but it gave me an emotional shock ultimately it was four o'clock in the afternoon and i had to talk loud about how I was so upset to my classmate. The next day at four o'clock, I my hands were covered in hives. And hmm. every day after that, at four o'clock, my hands would just break out in hives for about half hour or so. And then it became every change of temperature, I would take a shower and my body started ultimately within a few months, I would just break out in hives all the time. Hmm. Um, with change of temperature and I realized when the trigger was because the four o'clock timing was just so weird so that's when I started learning balance and I'm like okay you know I don't have to be perfect we healed the, the calf life is good let me just you know progress through this school ended starting my internship I enjoyed it but it did almost it was the end of me like talk about hives um my body was reactive at the at that time because of the previous trigger and although i was trying to work on this doing an internship is almost a death sentence because you don't sleep you're working er i was always uh, we were always called in so i was always doing er pretty much every few days you know i i would be overnight so then I, at that point i would break out in hives after every er shift wow that when i would finally like chill like go home then my body would just like blow up like a tomato mm. by the end of the year i became allergic to my tears so the only thing i had to cope with the stress was to cry and then i had to call out sick because i couldn't open my eyes my eyelids were just like the size of balloons you know wow so the internship needed to end and then it took about a year so my next job was perfect post internship I was able to not be put under so much pressure. I learned to take care of myself, just not push myself to the limits of needing to know it all, knowing to be perfect. So it took about a year for my body to stop reacting. I haven't broken into hives since then. Wow. 
Amazing. That was that was huge. Then I went on with my life in the in-home euthanasia service started. So this is very interesting and I completely agree that of with physical manifestations of emotional stress, of course. Having gone through that twice, do you have any tips for catching that sooner? I mean, it's hard because we learn when it hurts and we're very stubborn. And again, veterinarians are extremely passionate individuals. So my best advice is to take care of yourself as well as you take care of your patients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they keep us from sleeping at night. You know, you worry about your patients. If you don't know how they're doing, you're the most important person because if you can't survive, then you can't help anybody. But believe me, um, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Wow. E easier said than done, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that that was really interesting for your background and and how you really discovered how stress can can trigger certain diseases. What kind of examples do you see in pets? What what kind of examples do you see in our domestic species? So my own cat, one of them, uh, we realized that if we don't send him outside, he gets constipated. So managing the risks, but we need to be aware of the risks of boredom and being inside. So my own cat. Uh, was one of the triggers like, oh, my, this is so obvious, you know, and we rescued him from the wild. So we wanted him to live his best life. And he's 15 years old today. Um, wow. Again, he's not on any meds for being constipated anymore because he's living, he's fulfilled. Another example, and I'm happy that la last few years, people have come up with stress causing uh, the FLUTD, you know, mm -hmm. feline lower urinary tract disease in cats. So it's good, but I want to add to that again, like the the subtleties of stress, you know, and so f fulfillment, boredom. I've seen in my experience, so different pets together, if they don't like each other, you know, that will cause stress. So you will have urinary issues, all kind of issues, you know, if one cat is bullying the other, the other one might have chronic pancreatitis, for example. So I, this one one fun example, I guess, or a uh, happy ending example was... Um, this um, little puppy that was rescued from the shelter, spayed, had a little bit of an upper respiratory infection. She was sent home with a few different medications for pain and antibiotics. And then the, the owner came to me like two weeks later. This puppy was shut down, didn't want to eat. And I said to her, so, you know, what's going on? And the owner said, well, I have to shove the medication down her throat. You know, and everything the owner would do to the puppy caused stress. This puppy was so frightened. She had just been spayed again. Like So when this puppy came to me, I said, the first thing I asked the owner, I said, well, is she still coughing? Because her nose is dry. You know, she doesn't look like she's really sick. And she says, no, she's not. So I said to her, we're stopping everything. You know, the another veterinarian wanted to give her sub-Q fluids, like feeding tube, you know, like, no, let's stop. Let's just do nothing. Your hands are going to be loving. Every time you touch this dog, it's going to be for love. And it just took a few days and this puppy realized that, okay, I want to live, you know, this is not traumatizing. But I think one of the biggest mistakes we make as veterinarian is that we decide what is stressful, mm -hmm. what we mm -hmm. think is stressful, but the animals decide, you know, you could do so much to good dogs. You know, I had to burst an abscess, like, you know, put a drain in a dog that had heartworm disease, couldn't breathe well. There was no way I could sedate him. But the dog was the most chill dog. I could do anything to this dog. Hmm. And then you try to do something silly, super small, like giving a vaccine. And you have a dog that's going to try to die because the stress is so intense. Or you just separate an animal from its owner. And that alone is causing stress. I have a patient who has a seizure every time the owner drives into the parking lot of the hospital. Oh, wow. Like, that's intense. So just realizing, being completely aware of what the animals are telling us and adapting. I have a, a, a patient also that I come that comes to mind. He had a lot of urinary issues. And when I spoke to mom, it was amazing because I told her, you know, hey, any stress in your life? You know, any stress in your pet's life? Do you have a new animal in the house? She says, I don't have any new animal, but I have a sister-in-law that just moved in to my house and she rearranged my whole house. I don't feel at home anymore. So the owner was so stressed out and her cat became sick. So animals are little sponges and they will feed off of their favorite people. You know, mm -hmm. it's energy. Yeah. So I see a lot of animals that will age faster, like being, so doing in-home euthanasias, I'm always curious. So I've, I've seen that often the favorite pet of the owner dies first. 
It's the one that's the closest to the owner. And they happen to me. You know, I have uh, so someone else I know with two brothers. Okay, so she owns two dogs. They're two brothers, same age, came from the same place. One is turned completely gray. They're both about 11 years old. The other one looks like he's seven or eight. You know, he still looks young. The other one mm -hmm. is completely gray and he's her favorite. Yep. And it's it's okay. You know, animals have a life purpose. Also, they're here to cope with, to help us get through life. But sometimes that means they will die, they will take on a burden, they will prevent, saves us diseases because they take that toll and we hug them and we spend a lot of time with them to release that stress so our animals can really suffer from that. Yeah, It's a very good point because what you're describing is as vets, I think we're going to have to go through a mindset change. Like you said, like we're used to being perfect and solving all the problems right away in the first exam or the first day and... How do you feel, do you feel like the fear-free techniques are at least changing our mindset about like not pushing as hard, sending them home, maybe giving some anti-anxiety medications? Do you also think that those are aligned, like fear-free techniques will also are a good step forward? Absolutely, absolutely. Like you said, we do need to change our mindset. You know, when I work at the ER, you know, we're taught put in the biggest IV catheter mm -hmm. you can sure. or that exists. Like this is the one of the worst teaching ever. We can give blood transfusion through a 24 gauge catheter. You know, I see again patients like the stress level that they go through for really not good enough reasons. You know, uh, you can get away with a 22 gauge and most dogs and, you know, cats or again, smaller. So it's really not about us. And it's not about like for the vet one problem I see because when I confront the veterinary technicians and I'm like, hey, I still think you're cool, even if you don't put in an 18 gauge, you know, but it's the status that they yep. feel pressured to accomplish. And some of them have told me, well, we got yelled at by veterinarians that said, you know, this is wrong medicine. I'm like, oh my God. So luckily for this one little dog that came into the ER, all the, all the techs, you know, tried to place a huge catheter. This dog was, um, dying of HGE, like acute sepsis, and they, they blew all the veins. So this dog was acutely dying before my eyes. Then they, can't, they come to me and say, well, I'm sorry, we can't place any catheter. And I just like freak out because did you try a 24 gauge? Oh, no, no, because it's, it's not good. Like I can treat an HGE dog. Yeah. And so I was able to place a 24 gauge. The owner was holding her dog, telling her to hang in there. You know, her blood sugar was 30. I had given her some glucose on her gums and this dog lived. And it, again, like it put so much stress on me <laughs> mm -hmm. because looking back, I'm like, come on, guys, you know, we can do better. And I love you for going smaller. We need to change the mindset. And also, you know, I've seen pets dying of blood draw because it's too stressful. You know, you hear of dogs dying of nail trims at, you know, at the groomer, yep. having seizures like mm -hmm. We can do better. We need to refocus here. It's not about being a hero, being able to accomplish something, you know. And I involve the owners a lot when it comes to, again, nail trims. You know, if you're trying to, to trim nails on a bulldog or a Frenchie, I suggest you have the owner present. Just don't <laughs> <because> do it. <laughs> it's so stressful. An old cat, an old animal can't take as much stress. You know, you're pushing them over the edge and then you regret. So I've had a lot of bad experiences to reminisce and really promote caring, you know, being gentle in everything we do. So, I mean, we've all seen stress colitis from boarding, you know, mm -hmm. dogs will die in boarding because again, they feel rejected. Yeah. I mean, it's not just stress induced disease, it's stress induced death. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. that, that's what we're dealing with with humans right now. But yeah. if humans can't even get themselves to not die from stress, it's it's a hard ask for them, you know, to help their animals. But as veterinarians, obviously, and, and people who listen to this podcast, I think we can give some concrete examples. Like I was thinking after you went through that super stressful scenario with the HGE dog, you know, how do you, you know, to this day, we all deal with stressful stuff. How do you reset yourself after dealing with something like that? I spend a lot of time outside mm. trying to see the good in life. And, you know, I have my own animals. Um, I have a pot belly pig that found me. Um, <laughs> so I have a lot of uh, very comical characters that I get to spoil. I became vegan many years ago. That was part of my healing also, you know, wanting to do no harm, wanting to step lightly on Mother Earth. 
So that's, it's not easy. Again, I'm surrounded by a team that respects me and tries to grow also and be better at what they do so we have a jar of peanut butter that's the best thing in the world if you if you know you everybody needs a jar of peanut butter in their hospital <laughs> true because animals love it and then you can do so many things you know mm -hmm. you can trim nails much more easily mm -hmm. draw, blood, draw blood give vaccines you know those crazy puppies i mean you just give them peanut butter and they freeze you know they're mm -hmm. so happy and then you can examine them so um that's really motivating to always try to do better for the animals because it's really all about them. That's my reason to be alive. Yeah. I think, I think having doctors take the fear free certification class is a, is a great step in the right direction, right? In terms of reducing Absolutely. stress. And also, um, you know, we're being careful not to overdo things that we don't have to do. So I, I teach, I teach people, brush your pet's teeth. It's going to save you money. It's going to save your pet's stress. We don't have to put them under every year. So I'm huge on showing, taking the time to teach people. And ultimately, what did my own pets teach me? To brush teeth with peanut butter because mm -hmm. it's the best thing in the world. Yep. So, you know, main, most important thing is the brushing action. So I show people, hey, you know, you don't have to pry their mouth open. You don't even have to do it every day. Build a routine teach your pet again, let him lick the peanut butter. Like you can do almost anything um, with peanut butter. You're absolutely right. So obviously vets are going to need to look inside themselves to understand what stresses them out too, because they may just be, it may not have anything to do with the animals. It may be the environment that they're in as well. They may not want a clinic that does 15 minute appointments and Maybe they want to go to a slower pace clinic and that's okay. We as vets, like it's not about production numbers. So I think telling vets it's okay. Maybe you don't want to see 30 patients a day. Awesome. I don't either. And like being able to define what is great for you will help decrease your stress so that you can decrease the stress of your patients. Absolutely. Being uh, honoring who you are and not being afraid of who you are, because we always want to be anyone else but you, you know, we all, all yeah. have that. God, can I just be somebody else? Like, I don't want to deal with me and all my little quirks. Um, but yeah, em embrace who you are, your uniqueness and what you, what you can deal with. And you you change also. So we all grow through life and what you might be OK with doing today in five years, it might just not align with your values anymore. And so it's honoring the growth in you and then uh, reassessing your values and say, OK, now I, I cannot do this. I've learned some things. Um, I'm not going to do this anymore. You know, I, I don't uh, crop ears. I don't dock tails like that was a no, no from the start. And um, growing is the key. Right. And back in the day, like you're saying, people are like, why won't you do those things? Now, that's a regularly accepted practice, right? I don't think any vet on our team wants to or does declaws or tail docs or, or things like that. But I think now we're hearing a lot from doctors who don't want to do surgery. And so they're extremely anxious and stressed. And all the time they're doing surgery. And all I can think about is how that's affecting their animal patients. But as a veterinarian that's full time, you know, like, you're required to do surgery and you may lose your job if you don't. And so I think also that mindset is that not every veterinarian is a surgeon, not every veterinarian is a dentist. And if that's causing you stress, you're just giving that to your patients as well. I agree. And it's so true. But yet, yes, we've been forced into needing to do it all. Yep. When you look at the human side and, oh, my God, you know, they're so compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, we need to take better care of ourselves. And luckily, with the more specialties, you know, um, we are finally able to just be uh, honoring who we are and respecting what we can handle and what we just can't handle. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a great message. Is there anything else you would like to say to veterinarians out there to, in starting this journey to honoring themselves? reach out to any one of us, you know, uh, Marissa, Andrew, me, because you're not alone and we all have the same mental torture session going on. But ultimately, we have the best job in the world. We just need to tailor it to who we are. This well said. Well said. Yeah, we don't think about this enough. And thank you so much. No, I'm really glad we did this podcast. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you reached out to us. Um, I don't know how long ago, but I'm glad we made this happen. Yeah. It's a great team effort. So thank you guys for spreading uh, great words of wisdom. Yes. 
I love it. We hope you enjoyed this episode on the Indie Vets Happy Hour. Thank you for listening. Tell your friends, and if you like us, leave us a five-star review and make sure to subscribe so you can be alerted whenever we have a new episode. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, you can email us at clinical at indievets.com. Also, to learn more about us and how we're making vet med better, head to indievets.com. That's I-N-D-E-V-E-T-S dot com. While you're there, be sure to head to our blog for the latest stories and tips from our doctors. And lastly, if you're interested in joining our amazing IndieVets team, please email Dr. Andrew Heller at andrew at IndieVets.com. See you next time. Cheers. Cheers. I'm a veterinarian, sure, but I'm way more than that. I am also a tango dancer, a struggling but determined pie maker, and a mom. With IndieVets, I get to choose when and where I work. I create my own schedule and choose shifts at nearby animal hospitals that are right for me. Having that flexibility is exactly what I need to have plenty of time for all those other things that I am. Because I'm more than just a vet. Visit IndieVets.com to learn more and apply.